Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. If this is your first one, well, extra special welcome to you. And if you're a grizzled Sales Hacker vet, uh, well, thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, glad you're hanging out with us again. Um, this is going to be a great one. Um, I know I left this our, our pre-webinar call with a, a page full of notes, so I know that you will too. Uh, what we're talking about today is the five-part framework for sales readiness. Excellent, uh, excellent. Sorry, uh, super timely topic. Uh, sales readiness has changed over the course of the last year, as as we all know, um, and will continue to change as more and more companies kind of adopt a, a remote first uh, workforce. Um, and we've got a great discussion lined up. So we'll be chatting for the next hour or so. We have some slides, but as always, we want this to be super engaging. So we put these on for you, the community. I can see everyone trickling in now. Um, so if you have questions that pertain to the topic that we're talking about, please do um, get those in. Um, I'll be taking kind of a supporting role in this one. Russell's gonna be guiding the, the discussion. But I'll make sure that I keep an eye on the Q and A uh, and the chat. So, before I introduce my two guests, um, I do want to do two housekeeping items. So, number one, these are always recorded. So, if you got to jump off one on one with your manager, go close a big deal, um, go do that. Uh, this will be in your inbox within about twenty four hours. Um, and then number two, uh, for your questions, please use the Q and A feature. That's what I'll be manning. Um, but you can use the chat to kind of, you know, comment and say hello. Um, so we'd love to, to meet you. If you want to jump on the, the chat right now, say hello, uh, introduce yourself, your name, your title. Always more fun when we know who we're rocking with. Um, but that's it. I think that's the boring stuff out of the way. Um, let's dive right into it, uh, starting by introducing uh, my two incredible guests. Uh, we have John Giacomini the CRO of Agari. Uh, John, welcome, man. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. Excited excited to have you. Um, and just for context, um, for the people who have joined us, um, what's the quick background story? What's the, uh, the superhero origin story, if you will? How did you become a CRO at uh, such a big, fast-growing company? Yeah, no one else would take the job. Uh, um, so I, I've had uh, increasing responsibility in my career. Uh, many of you on the call uh, are in various stages of your sales career. Uh, my advice is be the best seller first. Um, managerial skills will come. Uh, most great sellers turn into terrible managers. So many of you probably resonate with that. If you're great at an individual contributor role, keep doing that. Probably make more money, have less hassles, and probably a better quality of life. Myself, I was kind of on the top of the leaderboard, but usually wasn't that number one or number two guy in any organization that I was in, uh, but thrust into a couple leadership responsibilities uh, over the course of my career and found that was where my passion lies: developing people, making more people successful. And for individual contributors, it's all about you. When you become a leader, it has to be about them. And uh, that is the trust of, of who becomes a good sales leader versus who will suck at it. And uh, when you can make that transom change to, you know, celebrating the success through others versus your own individual accomplishments, uh, you know, that's probably the key makeup for uh, for being a good, you know, a good sales leader. And the CRO position, uh, I joke, it's kind of a BS title in a lot of ways. Um, it's usually what the board of directors likes to blame. So they gave it a big lofty chief title. Um, but it really is around, uh, you know, forward facing anything that touches the customer falls under uh, the tutelage of a CRO. So it's a revenue role, but customer success, customer sat, things like NPS and areas of those that you know, aren't necessarily core to you know, closing a deal and getting an order booked um, still have a lot to do. And in the SaaS world with recurring revenue, Scott, being so critical, um, you know, earning the customer, the company usually loses money initially, but over time, you know, the lifetime value of that customer and the retention of that customer becomes a critical situation. And so, you know, that's what I find myself doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. I love that. A lot of insight in that. And that was just the, the introduction. That's, that's awesome. I have a follow-up question because something I've been, um, this has come up a few times on uh, uh, actually some, some podcasts on the sales engagement podcast is, do you remember, how did you mentally make the switch from an individual contributor when it's very easy to 
point to I did this, that means I'm doing good, to like uh, a director where you have a, a, a team and it's not so easy to see your direct actions turn into to results. You make you remember how you kind of made that that shift. And no one and, and no one's patting you on the back anymore yeah. as much. Um, I, yeah, I do. I, I absolutely remember the, the date and time, and it was out of desperation. I was with a company that had gone through a massive restructuring post um, dot com crash. So, my guess is the age of our audience. Some of them may have had to read that in a history book, but that was uh, you know late nineties, early two thousand time frame. And because I had some managerial experience in a previous role, I was an individual contributor at the time. I was the only one that ever managed anybody. So about sixty sales teams went down to seven. And I happened to be the one that had a little bit of leadership experience. And so the VP of sales, which used to be the lofty title, asked me to do a player coach role. And um, that is the kind of a toe in the water type of stretch assignment. And we ended up making a few quarters and magically I was, uh, you know, I was tapped on the shoulder to then become the director of sales for that team. Uh, and we started to scale and grow and frankly didn't go out of business like, you know, 80% of the companies that we were competing with at the time. Um, so it doesn't all go up and to the right in the world. There are some setbacks and um, I would tell the audience there's opportunity and chaos. You know, sometimes bad stuff happens, uh, but when there's turmoil, you know, be on the top of the leaderboard as a seller, find a way to keep taking care of customers and partners. And, you know, usually the dust will settle and you'll be okay in that regard. So it was out of desperation, Scott. That was, uh, that was how I, I be, you know, became, you know, pushed into the deep end of the pool and figured out that uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a good role for me. I like it. I like the the opportunity and chaos. It's certainly felt like a, a chaotic year, uh, but lots of opportunity comes comes with that. Um, and of course, also joined by Russell Worth, uh, who's the VP of Sales Enablement um, over at Showpad. Uh, Russell, welcome. Hey, thanks, Scott. Uh, I'll, I'll do a, a real brief uh, origin story because we actually just practiced Wait. this at Showpad. You know, part of part of our readiness exercise and. You know, John, you, you brought back some nightmares for me because I lived through the dot com era, but also the Y two K era. You know, I was an engineer. I actually, started out working. You know, sat in front of a computer during Y two K, waiting for something to happen. But after years of being an engineer, you know, I was a consultant for a while, and you know, we we built a great product, and uh, I thought we'd sell a lot of this. I went to my first trade show. We set up a booth. I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm the master of this tech. We got the best engineers. I know all the nerd knobs and how to turn them and make this thing hum in terms of a demo, but nobody was interested. The right people weren't coming to the booth and the people that came by were irrelevant. And I realized that, you know, I never had appreciation for sales and marketing in the past, you know, as an engineer, as a software developer, I just thought the tech would always win. And it wasn't until I had to do sales and marketing that I realized how hard it was and how it's really challenging to do right and do well. And like John, I got involved in sales and ailment because it's about helping people. I like coaching. I coach kids basketball. I like helping other people succeed and get better. And, you know, it's not about me. It's about the team. And, Salespeople, I, I like them because boy, they're they're clever. They're they're crafty learners, fast learners. But the, the information, the things we do, isn't structured. I think that's where I enjoy sales and ailment is to best enable them with the right information, knowledge, and skills to be successful, and, and then help the company be successful. Of course, that means more money for the engineers to build cooler things and better AI, which I know is a topic John's really excited about. Is all the product buzzwords. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So a little bit of background about me, and uh, yeah, I think we're ready to start off here, Scott, and kind of jump in. Awesome. Let's uh, let's do a shout out to to Brian Rude, who has joined us, uh, a founder of DG Benefits Company. Thanks for joining us, Brian. I see a bunch of others, um, and yeah, keep those keep questions coming in. As as mentioned, we are going to be doing some polls uh, throughout, so uh, be ready for those. But uh, Russell, without further ado, uh, take us take us away. Yeah, and let's talk first, you know, why this is important. And first and foremost, you know, I'm not going to talk about getting through slides quickly. We want to get through your questions and comments. You know, that's the goal here. So if, if you have those questions or comments, by all means, throw them in the chat. We'll have a few polls. That's the most important thing here. We've got a lot of slides to help facilitate the discussion. So uh, first and foremost, why is this important? Why is everybody here? You know, sales and ailment, it's a hot topic now because uh, it, it's uh, it's a lot of growth that people are going through or just trying to adjust to this new normal, but there's still a lot of ambiguity. So rather than talk about sales now in a broad term, we wanted to talk about a little bit more on sales readiness. And John, you and I talked about this, that really, you know, readiness forms for a reason around two of these areas. And we'll get to a readiness definition to set context in the next slide. But before we do, you know, 
from your perspective, John, we solve for readiness, you know, these two areas came up high growth and just that normal churn. I put normal in quotes because it's almost like that accepted evil that we have now that you build a team, John, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's always change in everything that occurs. So are you seeing the same? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it used to be, and I'll use the analogy of, of back when we were selling hardware, Russell, you needed a forklift to move it into the data center, but guess what? You needed a forklift to get it back out. And in today's world, SaaS is much faster moving. We are easier to hire and we are easier to fire. So the ability to move, um, you know, successfully in this environment, you've got to be relevant. You've got to be on your toes and you have to be relevant and valuable to customers. Growth creates opportunity, but it also creates, you know, as you highlight normal churn, churn is not a good word, but it's a reality of our business. And so winning customers with the right reason to be successful with them and then to keep them for, you know, a long time is, is the trick of the trade for, for the SaaS business. And as the statistics show, most people don't make their number. And unfortunately, I can agree that that is a fair statement. Um, but those that do, you know, it's just still a very lucrative world that we live in and the people that put in the time and the effort. And we'll talk a lot today about how you can be ready to be successful. Those are the ones that, you know, usually achieve over the long term. Yeah, let's talk about that in terms of readiness. And, and here, I just put this out here. There's everybody's going to have their own definition. So make it your own, you know, but for us here for today, we just want to talk about, you know, the collection of messaging, e-learning activities and practice, everything that you've got to do to prepare sellers through two major changes going on. One, they're brand new to the company, so they're onboarding. Or number two, there's a change undergoing existing reps, something new that's come up with messaging, a new product or a new market. So readiness, again, is all about getting the sellers ready. You know, and this isn't, uh, I use this uh, logo here by design. It's not just a check the box activity that we took people through the product one-on-one so they should be able to sell. That's just one component of it. You know, readiness is an ongoing continuous thing. And why we wanted to break this down a bit is just talk about some of these pillars here. We're going to spend some time in each of these areas. And uh, Scott, I think we might have a poll coming up here just in a minute. But what we're going to be diving deep on is uh, areas of on areas of onboarding product knowledge, skill development, coaching, and then continuous improvement being these five pillars of thinking about readiness as part of your sales and ailment program. So I think, Scott, did we have a poll to pop up for folks? Let's do it. Yeah, let's kick off the first one. So we're going to do a poll on onboarding. Uh, the question is, what do you feel is the main focus on your onboarding program for your go-to-market teams? Launching that now. And uh, usually I'll ask... Uh, Russell and John, you guys to 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 guess at what the results are going to be, but uh, I find sometimes that skews the results, so I've stopped doing that. <laughs> a lot of people will <laughs> will start picking that one. Well, after we so get we'll, the answer, Scott, I'll tell you what I would have said before okay. we, uh, we see the result, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll get people to um, see if we're we're correct. Perfect. Yeah, we should get Russell. You have to write your answer on the the whiteboard behind you <laughs> before you see the the result. All right, we'll give people five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right. So results are in. John, let's hear what you, you would have picked. So what I, what I would pick or what I think they're being taught? What you think, uh, yeah, what, what you think they're being taught? They're being taught, like, about the company. Like the history and like we, you know, that's what they're being taught. That would be, that would be my guess, which I wouldn't agree is the right thing to spend any energy on, but that's usually what happens. Yeah, I would agree. I remember every company I've been a part of, there's, there's like a full thing of the history and the, the whole, the whole thing behind it. Um, Russell, what, what about, what about you? Okay. So let's just, let's dive into the, the results. So, yeah. um, 3% said teaching them about the company. 9% said getting them set up with technology, software, and benefits. 63% uh, teaching them about the products and services. 0% uh, teaching about a competition. 14% teaching them about our customers. 11% other. Um, so vast majority teaching about the products and services, um, which, is, which is interesting. I know I have some thoughts on, on those results. Russell, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I want to talk about that as we jump into some of these other slides, because I think John, cool. to your point, that's the easy thing to do. It's 
you know, teach them about the company and about the products and services because everybody's market is pretty competitive. And we're, John, we're going to talk about cyber here because that's the industry you're from and I'm, I'm from as well and we know and love. But uh, you mentioned this, you know, this is all the competitors out there in the cybersecurity landscape. So anybody that's in cyber, this is what it looks like, who you're up against. And uh, John, what was this like you said? How many logos when this was first presented years ago versus how many logos are at now? I, I, I don't know that you counted them accurately or just a guess. Yeah, so Momentum Investors, um, I'm, I'm aware of the firm. They they do some buy side and sell side work on the VC um, elements, and I subscribe to their newsletter. I get this report. So the first one I recall looking at, Russell, there was 48 logos in total in what they characterize as the cyber industry. And if you decompose that, I'm going to say that was roughly 10 years ago. About 25 of those were actually IT infrastructure. Arguable, they were even security companies, but call it 50. Um, this report now, and you can't count these logos and come up with it this many because they can't fit them on, but there's close to 4,000. So my little company, if you look closely in the middle band, um, we're to the right side um, in the, the, the second, on the right side, second box down, right in the middle of the, uh, the messaging area. Uh, a little bit higher up on the cursor. It doesn't really matter, right, yeah. in, right in that box. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the concept here, like competition is a thing. So tying back to the poll question and learning about the company and learning about the products, we'll talk today a lot, Russell and I, about you know what lens you, you have snapped on. That is your company's lens. But I'm going to encourage you as you think about readiness to snap on the customer's lens. They don't care about any of that stuff. They don't care what your product does. They don't care what, you know, year you were founded or how famous your CEO is. They don't care about any of that stuff. They care about the problems that that capability will solve. And if they have those problems, they're going to try and do it in a way that's cost effective, seamless, and doesn't disrupt their business. And so when you think about onboarding and readiness, you got to snap the other lens on. You got to be thinking about what the customer sees, not what you think they see. And in a you know, competitive John, state like ours, there are so many companies, I tell you, you could find and replace 90% of the slide decks and we all sound the same in the cyber industry. And I'm sure for other industries, you could probably do the same thing. And the customers get decomposed by all of that noise and it's really hard for them to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, and you know, John, I think with sales nail and readiness, you know, that the start with why is important. It's it's easy to default if you're in sales nail to pick up where marketing and HR have established all about the company. I always call the old onboarding exercise as a branding exercise because it feels like you do have to, you know, get branded by the company, you know, drink the Kool-Aid, get excited, you believe in the vision so much. But if that's the first and only thing you're hearing during onboarding, of course you're going to regurgitate that in all your sales calls, all about the company, the history, and the vision. These are important foundations, but I'm on the mindset, your readiness program, spend less than 30 minutes on that, especially the first week. People are going to hear about that through company calls, your quarterly updates, make sure you touch upon it. But the most important thing you can do is come in and say, what's going on in the industry? What are some of those failed approaches? You know, what customers, why they need to change and what's the effort and cost of changing? Because, you know, while that first old way kind of makes you and the company look great, feel great, I made the right choice joining the intent here on the right hand side of this new approach, right, John, is to make our customers great. We got to make them great by understanding them. And I like that snapping on their lens. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's it's really difficult. And we'll talk in a minute about some strategies on how you can do that. But it's absolutely how you have to think. Um, and if you put yourself in a buyer's shoes, I, I do that often. Uh, I get prospected every day. Many of you maybe on this call have sent me uh, a great email about your product or service and why I should own it. Um, and oftentimes I get the dear XXX, that one gets deleted quickly. Uh, but I tell you, the ones that I'll pay attention to are the ones that put the extra effort in and maybe know a little bit more about me or us or our, our segment. And, you know, timing is everything. And the ability to kind of search out those kinds of personalization, it's, it's a must do. Anything generic is just, it's don't even bother. Now for you sales managers that are on the call that are, chasing volume with your reps and what have you. I know you'll probably cringe at that note, but activity for activity's sake doesn't drive the, doesn't drive your business. Yeah, I encourage people as you're thinking about revamping your readiness program, you know, it's easier to start with onboarding because you got fresh minds, you can take that new approach. Uh, one of the things I did, you know, years ago when I first uh, took on sales nail, it was cut out a lot of that stuff. HR wanted to cover it. You know, there's a lot of corporate things there, but moving into that why. And it was easy to kind of bleed in a little bit and start with product knowledge, you know, a little bit more. But I wanted to do it a little bit differently. Instead of talking about the speeds and feeds, just talk about 
What are the things we do? How do we do it? But most importantly, why does this matter and how is it different or better? Those last two bullet points are really, really difficult because oftentimes we take people through the product, how to demo it, how to showcase it. Yeah, I've got John, I've got you for five minutes. If I could just show you a demo. The best reps I know don't use slides or demos on their first call. You know, they can lead into that because they're asking good questions, which we'll get to in a moment. But this foundational knowledge of the product, I think, is important because you got to set the right context and avoid some of those uh, marketing buzzwords and marketing lingo. But, uh, John, I think you had the second bullet point. I want to hand it over to you. You get some good lines there about this when we talk about it. Yeah. So I, um, I was with a company for a little shy of three years called Silence, which invented a technology that brought artificial intelligence to the cybersecurity world on the endpoint to stop malware that had never, ever been seen on the planet before. Pretty prolific statement. Um, so I lived and breathed artificial intelligence. Now everybody talks about AI. Everybody has it in their bullets. And so the point here is if you don't really understand machine learning, neuro-linguistic programming, and all that goes into label tagging and improving your models, et cetera, don't just sound like everybody else because nobody cares. Nobody cares that it's AI or whatever your product and service differentiation is. They care about the benefits that it will bring. So the point here about not bringing it up, don't bring up things you can't talk about for more than 30 seconds. And so I would challenge anybody to do a description for me right now on artificial intelligence that lasts longer than that because I gave you mine and I lived it for three years. So the buzzwords can help you, but they can also hurt you because part of fails and part of being enabled and ready is being credible. Talk about the stuff you know about. You know, John, good point. I get sold to all the time and I, I had somebody that I was interested in their product, but they jumped right in and they said, yeah, we've got an AI platform, you know, and it's going to make a difference. And I said, well, that's interesting. How many data scientists do you have on your team and how frequently do you, tra do you train your data model? And of course, they didn't have an answer. They said, well, I got to get back to you about that. I'm like, well, what are you doing with your AI then? People are, you know, buyers are becoming more and more knowledgeable and we've got to keep up, you know, in the sales industry and sales mail. And I think it's very easy to think about some of these new buzzwords and try to jump right in. Similarly, to try to jump right to a demo, thinking that we've got the best UI, we've got the best demo, that we can go and showcase this and it's going to click immediately how this fits in your environment and the benefits it's going to provide when in fact it may not. It comes across as a canned demo, that you're going to take me through a click path that may or may not apply to me, my persona, my problems, or even how I can implement this in my environment. Um, so I'd, I'd say, you know, one of those, again, things, make sure people know what the product is and how it works, but don't use that as a crutch. Don't try to jump right to that demo right away. And, and definitely this last point, John, you and I have talked a lot about this is, you know, don't disparage the industry and the competition because you don't know where people are at. You could be common fraud or you could be pole position number one. But the best thing is, you know, talk about the customer first and foremost, try to lead them to yourself. But uh, anything you wanted to add to that fourth bullet point, John? Yeah, in, in, in cyber specifically, and it's probably germane to any industry, is our customers are fighting adversaries that are trying to hurt their business, injure their profits, put them in a bad way in the Wall Street Journal, et cetera. I have competitors that, yes, I want to squish them like a bug and kick their tail in a deal and win it by Friday and win before they have a chance to say anything. But the customer doesn't care about my competitors. The customer cares about solving their problems. And in the cyberspace, and I'm sure it's true in other software industries, you know, a customer is going to have an average of 15 to 20 tools. So if I spend all of my time disparaging the other investments that that customer has made versus investing my time to find the problem that I can solve uniquely and coexist to allow that individual to not have to worry about the implementation or the downtime or the disruption to his or her business while we leaf ourselves into that environment and become sticky. It's just a better way to go. And, you know, when you, when you down talk a competitor, you actually are you're, you're ruining your own credibility. Realize they're there and be confident and on the balls of your feet and understand your competitive landscape, understand your benefits against them. But realize that, you know, if you didn't have competition, you are in a crappy business. If you don't have good competitors, I'm telling you, you're in something that's irrelevant. So you should, you should welcome the competition and force yourself and your company to be better. Said a guy that that's managed actually, an endpoint sales force, which is the most cutthroat business on the planet. But, you know. Which it still is. I think we all still run several endpoint security technologies uh, today because it's, it's like a lot of other things. You know, there's always a lot of things in the environment. But, you know, John, I think this leads into, you know, uh, you know, pillar number three here, 
in sales skills. You know, this is one of the toughest things to do. And I think this is where real transformation can occur with the sales organization. Uh, it starts with them, but uh, bleeds over into the new hires. But talk to me about your passion with value selling and some of the components here about how you got to first put on, you know, change the lens with customer problems. Think about your solution and that, and that value. We've, we've hit on elements of it, but I want to at least bring up this framework. Yeah, well, thanks, Russell. So um, many of you have gone through some sort of formal sales training. I happen to subscribe to um, a, a program that is actually called the Value Selling Framework. Uh, value Selling Associates is a company. Um, and the bottom, the, the quote at the bottom of the quality of your life is defined by the quality of your question. That's actually my statement. That's not theirs. Um, but the, the concept here is really understanding the business issues that your customer faces. And I challenge the audience to think about a sales situation that they are in today. And could they articulate the business issue that that customer is facing? Not the problem, because we sell tech here. Most of the people on this call, I think, are technology related. Our, our solutions, our products solve problems. My challenge is, do you understand the business issues? Because business issues are usually way north of a technical buyer. Those are like our earnings per share, our customer retention, our growth, our international expansion. Those are the kinds of things you'd find in a public report that the CEO would talk about, the three or four initiatives that are, that are the, the defining factors for that company for the coming three or four quarters. And I will tell you, investments get made to solve business issues, not to solve technology problems. Now, sometimes that doesn't mean you didn't win. You can still win a deal. You can still you know, beat out the competition on a tactical basis to solve a very specific problem. But if I challenge you for a moment to ask enough good questions to understand what those real business issues are, and you're comfortable sometimes asking those of a prospect that couldn't answer them for you, which is going to require you to get to another level, get to a C-level potentially and ask those same questions, you'll probably get out of your comfort zone. But I want you to get comfortable being uncomfortable because if you do that, you're going you're gonna to crush your competitors because no one else will do it. They're going to stay where they're comfortable. They're going to want to demo the software in the eighth minute. Look how great we are. Your lens is going to stay on introspectively. And you're never really going to understand that prospect and that customer. And therefore, you've got a one in you know, 14 chance of winning. Yeah, you know, one thing I want to highlight here for folks in the audience to think about readiness is, is a framework like this. You know, think about your methodology and your framework. And the best thing you can do is find yourself a guy like John Giacomini that you align to, you know, define that because this becomes that framework that you can then deploy all of the things in an element, the concept, the training, the exercises, other things to develop those skills like rapport, storytelling, questioning, prospecting, you know, that, that motion, John, it starts with an executive like you, but then bleeds down at first level management or reinforcement and activation, right? Because we can't put this thing out there unless we have sales execs like you and the management team behind a program like this. It's not better product training. It's a better mentality. That's really what the methodology is all about. Well, I've never um, been in one of these out, these seminars where you know value selling associates would come in, maybe do a couple of days. I can't tell you any salesperson that jumped out of bed that Tuesday morning and they're like, oh man, I get to go do sales training today. However, those that embrace the techniques and they learn a little bit of something, they don't have to adopt the entire framework. But, you know, there's a there's a concept of, of just, you know, having a set of questions. I and mean, here's your bonus phrase for the day. I don't know if there's a poll question on this, Scott, but like how many good questions can you ask? You think about that for a moment. How many good questions could you ask? In other words, do you need you don't need to know anything about your product or service. And if you're really good at questioning, you could fill up an hour just understanding a customer. And I will, I will ask you to think about this for a moment. If you were on a Zoom like we are today and you asked enough good questions to the point where you got that prospect to talk for 40 minutes and you talked for 20, what do you think the average would be for the next five sellers that got to that prospect if you were 40, 20? I'm here to tell you it would probably be five to 10 minutes out of that 60 minutes. So I ask you, Who's in a better spot to make the next step in that, in that pr progressing that opportunity? The one that got 40 minutes of feedback from the customer's view or someone that threw up and vomited their product or service in demo 
and knows that the guy's a you know Seattle Seahawks fan because he saw the the you know the the number twelve in the guy's office, and that was about the rapport building that he did. If you ask good questions that are relevant, and you get the ability to let the customer freely answer them, and you listen and take good notes, and you feed off that, you'll be in a much better spot. And that's a great point to the next topic here, John, on sales skills that I want to talk about, which is research and avoid asking questions that you should already know the answer to. And, you know, between Zoom info and LinkedIn and communities and public filings, we almost have to enable and ready the sales team with discovery guides, things that they should go and uncover and how to uncover and use some of this technology so that we're not asking some of those questions that it's a waste of time. Because, John, I imagine uh, I've been on the situation, but I imagine you've had it where somebody calls you, they're prospecting, and they just have bad information, or they're asking you things that they should already know, because it's so prevalent, it's so out there, you know, that's, it's just, it's a waste of time. Instead, they should be asking better, deeper questions. I think this lends itself hand in hand to those five questions approach, right? I'm not going to um, sugarcoat this in cyber. Customers don't typically cough up things like, you know, what their other tools are, for example, because we're, we're kind of paid not to trust anybody. However, there are thematic things that happen in the industry. You know, many of you are following the, the ransomware attack that caused the pipeline in the East Coast to have our gas prices shoot through the roof in North America. Right? That's relevant. That has nothing to do with an individual's, you know, stack or tools. Ransomware is a real thing. It, you know, it attacks your computer and bad guys get paid lots of money. And, you know, what's, what's the customer to do? But, you know, our industry in cyber, like, it's like an ambulance chasing event. It's the worst thing you can do. That customer is in peril right now, right? So the ability to be relevant and understand the impacts of that, that news story can become part of the story that you tell. But you don't want to ever kind of attack somebody's, like, failures and make it your good. But as, as, as Russell highlights here on the slide, you can find out a ton in the public eye before you ever pick up the phone and make a call. And as a buyer, if someone finds out a relevant statistic or two or three about me or my organization or a challenge that we're having ubiquitously in our space, there's a much better chance that individual is going to get the next five minutes with me versus, you know, dear XXX and it's a bunch of generic stuff that, that really isn't relevant to me. So for public companies, read their public filings. The CEOs have to type out their strategy. The CFO has to talk about their, their performance. There's, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Pay attention to those things. Do your homework. And by the way, for the sales managers on the phone, this, this isn't the stuff that happens between eight and five. This is when your sellers are on their own time. But if they're going to be top of their game, they want to be a top producer, they want to be that 1%, that's what they're doing on their nights and weekends. This is not a 40-hour-a-week job. Selling time is precious. But this other work can happen as well. And then you're prepared for the, the opportunities as they present themselves. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there with a, a relevant question here. And uh, it, it sounds like it's, it's for John, but Russell would love your, your thoughts uh, on it as well. And it's, should you have your reps be doing the research or should that be owned by another team? It's an interesting question. I got an opinion. Go ahead, John. Um, so that's a challenging one, Scott. I never trusted anybody but myself. Um, <laughs> that doesn't mean that my research and validation would be perfect. So if I was uncomfortable in an area, that's when you would lean back on the team to validate or is there anything else that you could come up with? Um, I've never been with an organization that, that has probably enough staff to do that for me. So I guess I would say my history has been more self-sufficient. Um, that is not to say that you can't divide and conquer um, for the right size customer and the right size prospect. But um, again, public information and relevance, you know, another powerful tool is networking through people that know people. Um, you know, a lot of the selling happens and don't kid yourself. You do a great presentation, you knock, you know, you knock the ball out of the park, you're knuckle bumping your, your, your SE after the Zoom call. That buyer is going to go check with their peer group. They're going to ask about your product or service. And you're either going to advance that thing or you're dead in the water before you know what hit you. So knowing, knowing that power, center of influence, the reference customers, et cetera, that's super important in how you would prepare for a call like that. So, Scott, I would say I, I'm used to doing it kind of, you know, internally. But if you're with a company that's got enough people that can help you, the more the merrier. 
Then it's just a matter of organizing those and owning them so you can use that information to your advantage. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Great answer. Russell, what's your two cents on this? You know, I think there's some things like competitive intelligence or general market research for your ideal customer profiles or personas that you can centralize, but don't over-engineer it. To John's point, you got to make it your own because if you're a rep, you got to build your book of business. You got to build your brand, your credibility. And a lot of it's just readiness to help the seller frame up what is it they should be looking for and researching with these tools because otherwise they're going to end up down a rabbit hole. So I think coupling those things like having a company research have an ailment help create some of these discovery guides, research guides and templates, whether you're a BDR trying to get a meeting or an appointment or a rep trying to break in with account-based marketing. I think that's where they could use some, some help here to do better research so they can own it and, and build their book of business. So um, I do think the reps need to own it a, a bit more, but they definitely need help doing it right, doing it well, because it, it, there's often information overload, you know, once you start going and looking at these things and you, you really got to know what to look for and what not to look for. Totally. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you both. I think there's this thought too, where the context matters. So the, the act of doing the research, um, it's kind of like reading a book versus just, you know, quickly reading the Coles notes, your, your actual understanding and comprehension of the, the problem with the context around the problem is going to go up exponentially by walking through the act of, of actually researching as well. So I think there is that, that happy medium, but awesome. Let's keep it rolling. Yep, great stuff and, and great questions. Nick has a great point too with three by three because you can get pretty deep. You know, try to see what you can find on the surface. At least it shows effort. And as you get more time, that prospect shows interest. Spend more time doing research. You know, you don't have to research everything before you have that first call. Get just enough to build that rapport and get interest, and then go from there. But I think John, back to the questions and back to the research. This is a tough one to teach. Is oh. listening and. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world, isn't it? We've got two ears and one mouth, but how do you teach people to listen? Well, there's an old school adage that the next guy to talk loses. So it is a challenge. Um, I myself am a storyteller. I think that's probably one of the attributes in my career that I can look back on that, that has served me well. The quality of your life is defined by the quality of your questions. If you've got a good book of questions that are relevant, that are germane, that extract good information, the next thing you can do is shut up and listen. And in the concept of listening, you have to document. So open, probe, and confirm. OPC, again, these are borrowed from value selling, but opening, uh, open-ended questions, relatively generic, probing questions, tell me a little bit more about that, confirming. Did I hear you right? Or, you know, Bob, was it that you said, or Susie? I think I heard you say, play that back. That helps you kind of ingest it. And if you take some notes, I know some people um, want to just record the Zoom and that's good enough. Take some notes, play it back, unpack it, and really understand it. And if you do those things, you'll find that you're going to win the battle on who talked most because you want the prospect to be engaging. And if you can lead them down the path, it gets you to an end, not just questions for the sake of questions. Somebody said on the chat, I agree with that, right? You got to have some strategy. It takes some practice and some preparation. But if you listen and you listen actively and you confirm what you heard, it gives you a really, really solid framework to then go back to that customer with effectively the project plan for what's next, because it's their words, not yours. And you've confirmed it. You've used the opportunity in the engagement to confirm what you heard them say so it's not lost in translation. How many of you have sent the proposal after a great call and you feel like you like you never even talked to the person? Like it happens to all of us. But that was an, a, 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 that was an example of where active listening and note taking and confirming didn't occur. So therefore that, that, that proposal that went back didn't sound like the individual that you spoke to because you didn't tie off really what was important or what they meant or said. So I just challenge you to shut up and listen. Yeah, and a great way to build this into your readiness program, you know, we've done in the past, you know, role play scenarios, situation awareness, maybe even you've got e-learning with, you know, simulations of environments, you can test people there. But I got to tell you, the, the most powerful technology now, you know, and uh, not to turn this into a product pitch, a lot of people have this conversation on intelligence, take real calls, take, we, we do this now, take a live call that's been recorded that a rep's done, snip it out, and then play that back for somebody that's just joining. So that way they don't get the full answers, but you can test their listening skills. Take that two minutes where a customer is talking about themselves and ask those questions. What did you hear? What did you miss? What questions would you ask? It helps the reps practice listening. 
because now they're seeing it live and it's not so much of a simulation. They'll take it a little bit more seriously knowing this is a real world scenario. It's a real world event. This is how we can put a lot of these call recording conversational intelligence tools to play. Really, really powerful stuff. And hopefully that's a way we can start developing listening skills, assessing those listening skills with continuous improvement. Well, the last thing I'll say here, Russell, is silence is really uncomfortable for Stellars. We're just somehow our, our wiring. Now, when you were on the engineering side of campus, guys like me, we were we were probably on the intramural field or maybe in the campus bar. We were socializing. But, you know, it takes both of us, right? Um, dead space is really uncomfortable for Stellars. But oftentimes that dead space is the most powerful space because there's going to be something thought provoking or prolific that will come from that. So if you've asked a really, really good, insightful probing question, get comfortable being uncomfortable. If it goes 30, 40, 50 seconds, like you think the Zoom session just dropped, you'll probably put the customer in a bit of chaos. But I promise you, if you just keep smiling and looking in the screen, you're probably going to get a better answer than if you just try to answer it for them or interject. It's a challenging skill for people to develop, but one that my career looking at the best, most prolific, and frankly, wealthy people on the planet are sellers that are masterful at that. You, you know, John, you bring up a good point. I saw one of our reps do this earlier this week, is just do that pause, dramatic pause, and say, before saying, I got the answer, coming across as a know-it-all, it's like, let me think about that question just for a second. Do you mind if I just take 30 seconds and formulate some notes here? The customer actually dug in. You could see the body language. You're like, wait a second. Okay, I'm not getting ready for the canned defensive you know, response that we may have for objection handling. You could tell some thought was put into that. But it is really tough to hit that pause button and formulate those thoughts. It shows you're listening, though. Well, next pillar here we want to talk about is coaching and uh, something I'm passionate about, John, you have a lot of great uh, topics here, but talk about your approach, you know, how to get ready for the game back to readiness, you know, your, your approaches for kind of the pre-call planning and post-call planning or post-call assessment of what happened. Yeah. So um, we talked a little bit about this, maybe for some of the sales managers and leaders that are on this call today, you know, you can really help your team by getting them ready for what's going to occur. A sales call for the sake of a sales call, if you're a volume-based selling organization, you know, I know everybody gets hung up on the metrics. I'm here to tell you the world is changing rapidly with regards to how many versus the quality. And so a pre-call plan, it might be the same for a physical industry, a vertical, et cetera, but just taking five or 10 minutes to make sure that you've done a little bit of the research, you didn't over-rotate, you understand the, 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 the vertical. You've maybe done a quick you know, scan on the Wall Street Journal website about any relevant news that's happened for that industry. Just being ready for who's on the call, their titles, whether we know anything about them. Do we have any, any like uh, references or we connected to other customers over LinkedIn? Just be ready for the deal, ready for that opportunity. I used the analogy talking to Scott the other day about fly fishing. You know, I don't know if anybody fly fishes, but you know what? They call it fishing for a reason. It's not catching. And, you know, you can cast 50 times and not get anything. And if you lose your concentration and you're not ready, guess what? Fish somehow know that. They're going to hit the strike on the 51st cast. And if your your defenses are down and you are, you're not like that's the first cast of the day because it's the 51st, you miss that fish. So pre-call planning is getting you ready for that, you know, the, the, the technique of that cast and being ready. So when that prospect is ready to strike, um, you know, that, that, that bug, you're ready to hit it. And then on the post-sale side, you know, if you've listened well, you've asked good questions, you've taken good notes, this is just an opportunity to really quickly chalk talk about what happened. Make sure that you heard the same thing. If there's multiple people on the call, we will all heard the same words, but we may have like picked up on some body language or someone leaning in or somebody's arms were folded that we have to understand where they fit in the organization. The ability to really tie off quickly, again, a, a forgotten art because we're on to the next demo. 30 minutes later, and then, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, oh, that, that 10 o'clock call this morning, I got to look at my notes. Make time to tie off what you just did. It'll help you progress them. And most importantly, qualification is another important facet of successful selling. It'll, it'll allow you to decide if you're going to pursue. If you really listened, you really heard what they said, it may not be an ideal prospect and your time is valuable. You may decide to fire that prospect. You know, great points there, John. For anything I'm doing on the nail side, I always try to 
block off 15 minutes after the fact, at least do that quick assessment because there's, there's no feedback like that live real time feedback. Uh, if you're doing that early morning call on a Wednesday and then it's Thursday afternoon when you debrief, a lot could be lost there. So it's really important being ready for the game, you know, the pre-call planning and post-call review and assessment. And I think for player coaches, you talked about being a player coach, but I like this analogy that you had when talking about coaching, because it's, it's probably hard for that sales manager now that they're a coach to try to jump in. And you had this phrase, you know, spare the life ring. Talk to us, talk to us about this. Yeah. You know, for the, for the sales leaders, the player coaches on the phone, we all have a better answer than our, our salespeople. We, we, we would have handled it differently. Like get off your high horse, right? Everybody's doing the best they can, but if you truly want to build a sustainable, successful managerial career, you got to get good work done through others. And so just like I asked for the comfortable silence, you have to be comfortable letting somebody fail. And the life ring, the, the, the graphic here, it's easy to throw the life ring and jump into it and swim to shore and you know drag your rep along for it and tell them next time you got to be ready for that. My experience is that sales managers that throw the life ring and jump in the life ring, they usually end up building an enabled sales team who doesn't have to actually ever get good because they know, you know the boss man or the boss woman is going to jump in and save the day. And that sales leader who likes to, to, to be the life ring won't build a sustainable culture. And I'm telling you, eventually your career's over. You've got to get good work done through others. So hire well, enable them, and use the chaotic, crappy moments as coachable moments to raise the game. Because the skill that you can develop over a bad situation far outweighs the victory that just went really smoothly because those are really difficult to repeat. So help, assist, coach, add value, don't take over. I mean, occasionally with a brand new rep, maybe you have to, but if you get used to doing that, it's fairly Pavlovian. Like if you do it for them all the time, then they're just going to get things started and let the boss take over. And if you're trying to scale your business, um, that's not a good way to do it because you become time bound by how many calls and how many you know things you can get involved in. So, you know, do the, do the, do the coaching in the locker room and in practice, but during the game, you got to try and be pretty quiet which I know is a challenge for a lot of you and myself included because it's natural for us to throw the life ring, but I challenge you to not do that. And, and takeaway here, if you're in an ailment, ask the managers where they're throwing that life ring frequently, that you can build that into your readiness program more effectively. Or if you're a manager and you feel like you're throwing that life ring frequently, man, pick up the phone or hit somebody on Teams or Slack that's in an ailment and tell them, look, this is something we may be missing. Let's find out first and foremost, is it the rep or is it the program? If it's the program, we can address that. Because maybe something was missed. Maybe it needs more reinforcement. Maybe it was something that was covered six months ago and was forgotten. But back to readiness. This is where you readiness can help both the rep and the coach here. So the coach can do those things, developing knowledge and skills and not always trying to haul in every single deal, which is tough, John. I mean, if you've got all these people out there fishing, but you got to be the coach reeling them all in, boy, that doesn't scale. You're exhausted if you're a manager at the end of a quarter with those kind of activity. Yeah, it's just not scalable. Also. And last, you know, I, I, you know, we talked about continuous improvement a bit, uh, but this is kind of where it all comes together because you got all this chaos going out, you know, between the manager, the sales rep, and the buyer. A lot of interaction, a lot of information flowing, a lot of activity. So it's really a lot to assess, you know. So if you're looking at, you know, as an enablement practitioner or a sales manager trying to improve your readiness program, how do you continue to improve? Like, where do you start? We'll talk about some tips here, but John, you had this great line, you know, the change occurs when chaos happens. You know, talk to us about that. Well, I mean, we're in a chaotic world. And so I don't think there's any firm ground for this is how you do things. I think you have to continue to adapt to buyers, focus on buyer personas and focus on what buyers care about. Your internal programs, your internal processes, again, nobody cares, right? Turn the lens around, snap on the telephoto that's the buyer lens, not the wide angle that is your lens. And in doing so, you have an opportunity to probably qualify better, which is the ultimate skill. The, the highest paid sellers that I've come across in my 30 plus years of doing this, they qualify really, really well. So they take advantage of all of this. And I will also highlight buyers have a lot of demands on their time. They're moving from one situation to the next. You are not the only piece of software or service that they're considering at any one time. They have multiple. Use this opportunity. Use the chaotic world that we're in to project manage those buyers. The more you do for them, the more organized, the better listening you do, the better notes you take, 
the better feedback you confirm, the way you follow up, you'll make life easier for them. And ultimately, those are the people that win because it's a risk reduction conversation. Buyers don't make decisions unless they're reducing risk. And if you can show them the path to your product or service being a risk reducer for them, it's going to go to the top of the stack. And that is just the, the ability to take advantage of these chaotic situations, synthesize them down to the simple, and project manager buyers. Yeah, and for readiness, how do you bring back all those elements and stories again to think about where you're going to improve your readiness program? And, you know, two slides here before we end up here on time. I'm glad we're going to be able to land the plane on time. I want to make sure that, again, if you've got questions or comments, please jump in and, and ask them. We're not, uh, we're okay to pause here. We don't have to get through all the tech, but we're just going to keep on keeping on, uh, but address the questions as they come up, Scott. But thinking about continuous feedback, John, you know, we, we try to get a lot of data and be completely data driven. You know, I'm looking at surveys, you know, whether they're anonymous surveys or, you know, looking at profiling information, we're, we're trying to get off the record interviews or structured interviews. We've got the manager assessments that can tell us what's going on in their perspective. And of course, all the data from our enabling platforms and tools and the CRM. But you really talked about a key part of feedback is how do we celebrate that white space, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of, I don't use the, like the term paradigm shift, but this is like a personal situation for me. Um, as a, a senior leader of a sales organization, it's easy to pick on the stuff that the rep didn't find out. And, you know, whether you're the door slamming, berating, fist slamming sales leader or not, it's easy to berate that situation. I've turned my tune um, in my more adult life as I've matured. And I don't know, some would say I might have mellowed, but I don't think I've mellowed. Is you got to celebrate the white space for the sales managers, for the reps. What you don't know is the most exciting part of the journey because you can identify it and then figure out the strategies and put your energy towards figuring out what you don't know, whether it's the elusive committee that signs off. Well, what the hell does that mean? That's just an objection that slows down the deal. That's the way the sales manager would look at it, you know, in the 1.0 version versus, hey, we don't understand anything about that committee. But you know what? We know that they just bought X or Y three months ago, and I'm linked into a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. Maybe we can get to them and find out what that committee looked like. How did that work? How long did it take? Did we get access to them? You celebrate the white space. It's a bit of a shift in your mindset. But if you celebrate the white space, you'll be alarmed at how much you don't know. And again, I like to challenge people, a deal you have working today, could you identify the white space? You know what you know, but could you identify the stuff you don't know? I promise you, if you took the time tonight or over the weekend and you wrote down what you don't know, if it doesn't two or three X the information that you have, you're just kidding yourself. But the beauty of this kind of thought twist is if you celebrate the white space, every time you knock something off, you got a little bit more clarity. And oh, by the way, as you knock out that clarity for your lens, you're actually putting the lens back onto the customer that you understand their situation a little bit better. And at the end of the day, only one gets to pop out. This is a game of first place wins, second, and everybody else loses. So using this technique to kind of help yourself mature and, and progress your opportunities is a, is a way that I've found to have some significant impact to the success of the sailors that, uh, that I look after. Yeah, and part of that white space and enablement trying to build your, your readiness program is getting all those things and gathering them and running a dashboard like this. I came across this a few years ago, the Eisenhower matrix, which I think is important, you know, or I think it's critical to think about how do I communicate to my execs and my managers about what we're doing and what we're not doing. Yeah, there's always going to be something urgent that we've got to focus on for this quarter, uh, for, for change that might be occurring, those things that are unexpected, high impact, they're very rushed, but managing things that are planned, long-term goals, the things that are important. So we got to make sure we try to do those urgent, important things first, schedule or delegate those things that may be less important, less urgent, but keep that list of things that I say deleted here. That's the ice power matrix has it in there, but just keep it on the backlog so you can communicate that because oftentimes maybe some of those things can be reassessed because the level of effort to do it is low. The impact is high. That can become urgent and important. So back to that white space, the stuff you don't know with your, with your readiness program, use a matrix like this to try to clarify all those requirements about what you need to do and who's asking for it, that you can build a successful readiness program and hit on some of those foundational elements. But uh, just to wrap up here on time, I want to hit on some key takeaways. And again, if you've got questions, uh, please pop them in the chat or pop them in Q&A. Scott, let us know if you've got any that come across here. But uh, I think yeah, we've, got, foremost, we've got one go ahead, uh, good one that we can, we'll can we get to after you, you wrap up some of the, the key takeaways. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, with readiness, you know, there, there's no lack of technologies and methodologies that, that you can have here. But John, I think you highlighted how important it is that you got to have a leader that's, that's going to be behind it, that sales executive that's going to sponsor it, but then who's going to own it? Sales manager, somebody in marketing, somebody as a nail leader. That's going to be important for success, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm not hung up on a title, but, you know, the CRO or the chief whatever, if you don't have sponsorship at the right level, you know, then it becomes something you do versus something that actually takes a, a, a hold of an organization. Again, value selling, I'm not pitching them. The medic, Sandler, there's 50. Of them. I don't care which one it is. But if it has a, a bit of a, a cultural thread through the organization and the sellers embrace it, even if they pick up a few kind of techniques or things that they commit to, anything in that in that regard will, will assist them in being successful. Um, but you know, the days of watching videotapes of the yellow bird bath and the, the blue bird bath, which by the way I did, that was Tom Hopkins in the early 80s and beginning of my sales career. To this day, I still use some of those techniques, right? I mean, not that. Some of that would be like really cheesy. Those are some bad suits and some really bad hair on some of those, those sales trainers like Zig Ziglar and what have you. Uh, but some of those core tenants, those are part of being prepared because you got to got ask good questions and be in a situation to move a needle forward. But don't put a methodology in unless you got support for it because that's just a waste of time and money. No, a great point. Now, almost secondarily to that, you know, coupled with it is just make sure that you've got the frontline managers bought in because that's important with readiness. That's where success and failure occur. As we talked about, that's a great feedback mechanism for where readiness might have some challenges. They're throwing the life ring a little bit too much, or they're going to have a lot of insights in terms of how to best onboard. Because before you have an enablement program, before you have readiness, who's doing the onboarding? It's those frontline managers. And they may be imparting a lot of good things, knowledge, skills, and, and techniques, but then again, they may not because they may have been a rep that just got that battlefield promotion and there's better ways to do that. So that's where I think frontline managers definitely contributes, uh, but also need to be there to assess performance because they're, the, they're going to know more earlier than anybody, whether the readiness program is working or not. Yeah. And they also Russell have the ability to reinforce some of those core tenets. So simple things like forecast regimens, one-on-ones, you know, use the elements of your methodology in some of that normal course and speed activity. It helps reinforce that it's important. And it turns it into muscle memory. So it then becomes something that's not something you do. Oh, I've got to do my X or I've got to fill out my Y. It just becomes the normal process of how you, you interact with customers and sell. Yeah, and with a lot of what we covered here, where do you get that source material, whether it's, you know, for onboarding, about the product, about key skills, there's no perfect rep, but you can definitely leverage some of your best reps for their specific strengths. I hear this all the time talking to sales managers that they've got reps that are terrible at building pipeline, but they're fantastic at negotiation. They have every comfort level talking about pricing, but they have no idea about how to ask good discovery questions and really learn about the customer. They're expecting their BDR to do all of that work. So definitely think about, again, back to that value selling approach and framework with readiness. Think about how you can leverage your best reps, have them be the videos, the examples of good, whether it's a scenario that you set up, but even better if it's one of those live calls that the people can practice excellent listening, or they can, I'm sorry, they can practice uh, active listening. They can go through and listen to that scenario and that can be part of that readiness program. And then last point here, you know, is that uh, John, you said it best about, you know, you've got to have these other than needs, you know, the OTMs, that sales is a team sport. So while we're trying to get everybody ready, yes, the onus is on that rep to get ready. It's on enablement managers to build the right programs to get ready. But there's a lot of people involved in readiness, right? We've, we've touched on a lot of different departments here, product, marketing, sales, sales managers, enablement. But I think you had a good line here when it comes to winning as a team, losing as a team. Yeah, it's simple. I tell the team this every day. You can win every deal you want by yourself, and I will applaud you, but we will have a tough conversation if you lost by yourself because it is a team sport, and buyers don't expect to just deal with an individual. And if you got lucky and closed it all by yourself, pat yourself on the back, again, that is not sustainable. That was just lucky, a lucky situation. Learn how to leverage the resources to the left and the right. Manage them effectively. You know, if people weren't prepared and did a lousy job, make sure it's known that that's not what you expect. But the more people you can scale into your prospects, the more you can do and the, the higher your results will be. So don't lose a loan. I love it. I love it. We, we actually have a, uh, a saying similar to that. Losing a loan is a fireable 
offense, um, which is the same same line of, of thinking. Gentlemen, this has been incredible. I love the quality of your life defined by the quality of your questions. Good work done through others. Uh, got a ton of notes here. We had such good feedback um, from a bunch of our, our guests. So John and Russell, thank you both so much. Uh, to the sales hacker community, thank you so much for being so engaged and, and asking really thoughtful questions and, and comments throughout. Uh, but we'll certainly have to have you gentlemen back. That was a lot of fun.